Feedback is really an accountability measure for schools. Um, it is a range of subjects that our politicians think that all children in state schools and academies should follow. So we're talking about modern foreign language, history or geography, uh, sciences including computer science um, and maths obviously and English. So they believe that all young people should have that as a core of subjects. Our current year sevens, um, it is expected that they will all follow the EVAC by the time they get into Key State to Fall. Well, as part of my role here in the college and uh, looking at pathways uh, for students to progress from Key Stage 3 into Key Stage 4, which uh, involves them taking their options and choosing their GCSEs and their BTEC choices, uh, it's crucial to have an in-depth knowledge of the EVAC uh, and uh, the way it's used by the government. And obviously, as we're aware, the EVAC is a performance measure, it's not a qualification in itself. Um, so it's a suite of subjects uh, that we would choose from, um, or students would choose from, um, and, uh, and that would make up an academic profile um, that students would take. What do I know about the EVAC? The EVAC, the English Baccalaureate. Uh, well, the EVAC is a measure, it's not a qualification as such, it's just a measure for schools, really. It's a measure based on the curriculum, on how many of a particular permutation of subjects a pupil does and they are generally core subjects so your sciences, your English and maths, humanities and um, uh, foreign languages. That's what I know about it. This documentary focuses on the EBAC school performance measure that was introduced in 2010. The Year 6 students that went into Year 7 in June 2015 will be the first student group to fully follow the EBAC, taking their GCSEs in June 2020. EBAC itself can have positives and negatives for different subjects, which will be explored in the various interviews that were filmed involving teachers and different subjects at our college. What are your thoughts on EBAC? Uh, well it seems quite limiting. It seems like a system that is saying that one group of subjects fits all students and limits the choice for students. Obviously if you have to, if you're forced to take a language and a history or geography then you're going to have less options to pick more creative subjects or PE. How is EBAC going to affect your subjects in the future? Well personally I suppose it could take away from the numbers, you know, mm -hmm. if, if students are forced to do a history or language, you know, uh, Obviously, they have to do a maths and uh, science and English at the moment, you know, but if they're forced to do those other subjects, then they might not pick photography as another option, uh, you know, and then obviously it could decrease numbers on the photography courses, which would mean my classes would be smaller, yeah. and um, ultimately, you know, if I don't get enough students, then I haven't got a job, mm -hmm. you know, so. And photography is quite buoyant, there's quite a lot of students who want to who wanna study it, but maybe they want to study it as an option of something that they haven't done before, you know, something to uh, something that they're keen on, and it, but you know it might not be at the top of their choices, you know, <coughs> which you know, at the moment you get that freedom to pick subjects like that, you know, ones that you just mm -hmm. want to explore and quite like the sound of. So, um, how has EBAC affected your subjects in the past, and how will it affect your subjects in the future? Uh, well, obviously, it's it's helped us because it's pushing more students into the subjects. A lot of parents now like their kids taking these back subjects. Right. Um, so we found our uptake of computer science is growing over the year now because of that. Um, in terms of drawbacks, um, we're kind of getting a lot of students maybe that are more of the creative ones who like the art and design that have been pushed maybe into this sort of area or subject. So what does this mean for your subject as a history teacher, like for you and students? I trained here at TTC with Mr Browning and you know over the last seven, eight years I've been a history teacher, we spent many times like having chats about the prospect of history being a compulsory subject. EVAC will, for all intents and purposes, make history and geography, I think, a compulsory subject across the country, which ultimately means, I think, a history department is going to need more history teachers. A history department is going to have more history students at GCSE. And we're very fortunate that we have a, a cohort each year, which, not always, but by and large, at the very least enjoys the subject and uh, enjoys the subject and wants to be there and I think in a couple of years time we're going to be faced with the prospect perhaps like English maybe like maths like science where 
you might have lots of students who enjoy it, but you might also have students who really don't want to be there, and yeah. we're going to have a, a different challenge that we face already. What uh, implications does this have on the industry, like your industry? Like I think it has, a, it has a huge impact. I think we saw not very long ago they decided that a modern foreign language wouldn't be compulsory, so immediately um, the numbers dropped, um, teachers stopped training to be modern foreign language teachers, and now they've included it in the EBAC and realised yeah. they've now got a big crisis because they haven't got the teachers. I think we're going to see the same thing. This country, one of the biggest industries in this country is creativity in, um, in music, in drama, in um, art. We are the forerunners and if we're not going to get people inspired and interested in that, we're going to lose that and that's going to be a big gulf in our country. And as I said, it's not going to be just about that. We're not creating robots. You know, some people look towards the Chinese way of teaching and thinking that you know they've come out with amazing results, but they have real issues with being able to deal with solving problems and that kind of creativity that we need in, in our human beings. Mm. And I think we're in danger of losing that until we get to the point where there's we suddenly realise and then they suddenly want creativity back. So what implications does EBAC have on the industry as like your industry? I think, industry? you know, what you might, you know, you're still going to get your very academic, very capable, very able, you know, high-flying students entering the industry. But I think what it might remove is students who perhaps want to do a more vocational, more technical uh, award in technology, you know, going on to the industry, it might, it might reduce that. Uh, and that would be a real shame because I think there's a lot of skills that they learn in technology and um, students may not get that exposure to put them in that position. Do you think it will um, like affect universities in the long run, having like limiting students? To I think it might up university intake because students will have all been through the same rigorous process uh, academically of the subjects, so they'll be very prepared, I think, for university and they'll probably have the entry requirements, um, but possibly students going on to perhaps more creative education might not be so practically prepared, you know, skills-wise, that they learn at a secondary school. Is there anything else you'd like to mention about EBEC? Um, yeah, just one thing. It's interesting, something you picked up on, you, you mentioned how media might be at risk. And I just think it's a bit of a joke, really, how the media industry is, along with the computer games industry, the biggest in the world. Yeah. So in terms of the job market... Why wouldn't the government consider it a valid option? Magazines, publications, television, it's a massive industry. I just think it's a real shame that why wouldn't you look into that? Why wouldn't you see it as the industry that it is and say to kids, okay, yeah, go for it, you know, we'll, we'll give you the skills. But instead they're just cutting it off saying, no, we're not going to do it anymore. It seems very strange to me. These were all opinions on and around EBAC. From those interviews you can see how EBAC has good and bad points to it. We will leave you with a TED talk performed by Sir Ken Robinson who is an expert on education. Um, so I want to talk about education and I want to talk about creativity. My contention is that creativity now is as important in education as literacy and we should treat it with the same status. Thank you. Our education system has mined our minds in the way that we strip mined the earth for a particular commodity. And for the future, it won't serve us. We have to rethink the fundamental principles on which we're educating our children. Our education system is predicated on the idea of academic ability. And there's a reason. The whole system was invented around the world. There were no public systems of education really before the 19th century. They all came into being to meet the needs of industrialism. So the hierarchy is rooted on two ideas. Number one, that the, the most useful subjects for work are at the top. So you were probably steered benignly away from things at school when you were a kid, things you liked, on the ground you would never get a job doing that. Is that right? Don't do music, you're not going to be a musician, don't do art, you won't be an artist. Uh, benign advice, now profoundly mistaken. The whole world is engulfed in a revolution. And the second is academic ability, which has really come to dominate our view of intelligence because the universities designed the system in their image. If you think of it, the whole system of public education around the world is a protracted process of university entrance. And the consequence is that many highly talented, brilliant, creative people think they're not. Because the thing they were good at at school wasn't valued or was actually stigmatized. 
And I think we can't afford to go on that way. In the next 30 years, according to UNESCO, more people worldwide will be graduating through education than since the beginning of history. More people. And it's the combination of all the things we've talked about, technology and its transformation effect on work, and demography and the huge explosion in population. Suddenly, degrees aren't worth anything.